Storied windows richly dight. You may have heard that phrase before. The entire sentence is storied windows richly dight, casting a dim religious light. It's one of the most quoted poetic phrases about stained glass, and with good reason. Dight is a Middle English word that means clothed. The phrase means richly detailed windows that illustrate stories. It comes from a poem by John Milton, the 17th century Englishman who wrote Paradise Lost. It's an appropriate phrase to describe the windows of Detroit, or of any city, from my perspective as an historian of American stained glass. While it's obvious that each window illustrates a story, whether of a biblical episode or a corporate logo, the story told by the group of windows together is of the growth and development of the art of stained glass in the United States. I'd like to say before I start that I'm not the authority on Detroit's windows. I'm writing a book on the history of stained glass in America, which should be published in 2018. So I will be presenting Detroit's windows in the context of what else was going on in the country at the same time, concentrating on those windows made in the United States. But if you're really interested in what stained glass there is in this city, and there's a lot of it, you'll need to find these books. Discovering Stained Glass in Detroit by Nola Hughes Tutag, and Detroit's Historic Places of Worship by Marla Collum, Barbara Krieger, and Dorothy Kostich. You should also look at the website of the Michigan Stained Glass Census, whose address is on the screen. This is sponsored by Michigan State University. They've been surveying the windows in the state for a number of years now and have a great deal of important information. Detroit's most vibrant period of stained glass was during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Population growth in that time was exponential, doubling every decade between 1880 and 1920, and this was before the automotive boom. Over a third of this growth was immigrants, most from Euro Germany and Eastern Europe. Detroit was third in the nation as a hub for immigrants, after New York and Chicago. The history of stained glass in Detroit during the heyday of the craft in the United States is dominated by imports from Germany that adorned the many Catholic churches in immigrant neighborhoods in the city. In 1900, almost 40% of the city's population was Catholic, more than twice the average of other Midwestern industrial cities. In general, Catholic congregations favored what is called Munich-style glass, such as the window shown here by Meyer of Munich. Munich glass is characterized by a hard, realistic style, very finely and heavily painted with sentimentalized figures. A distant second in volume is glass from England in Protestant churches. The various Protestant faiths comprised almost 60% of the city's population. The largest sect was Lutheran, with mostly German immigrant adherents, followed by Methodists, Episcopalians, and Presbyterians, the majority of whose followers were of British descent. Lutherans, like the Catholics, tended to follow ethnic preferences for stained glass and bought from German studios. But the British-based faiths preferred English stained glass, like this window, or American stained glass. It's the American stained glass that we'll be looking at here. The style and history of stained glass has always been connected to architectural style. In the United States, as in Europe, the growth of the Gothic Revival in the mid-19th century spawned the development of the craft. The style came to Detroit in the 1840s with the construction of the Mariner's Church, which now has modern stained glass. Without any prior history of making stained glass, most American-made windows were quite simple, with geometric quarry fields and painted borders until the 1870s. Several Detroit churches were in the High Gothic style favored in New York, such as the first Jefferson Avenue Presbyterian Church, which was replaced in the 1880s, and the Fort Street Presbyterian Church both designed in 1855 by Albert Jordan, an architect trained in Connecticut, where he undoubtedly was familiar with the work of Richard Upjohn and James Renwick, the foremost American Gothic Revival architects.
and the teachings of the Ecclesiological Society, a British group dedicated to the revival of the Gothic style for church architecture. But the style of the windows was similar to those in the Mariner's Church. We know from records in New York that the colored glass was imported from Germany and was available in only eight colors until the 1860s. Here I show you an aisle window from Trinity Church in New York of ten years earlier for comparison. Both windows have center fields of white diamonds, lightly painted with floral designs, and richly colored borders and tracery. This was very typical for the period between the 1840s and the 1870s. The sources of the designs were English architecture books like those by A. W. N. Pugin, decorator of the Houses of Parliament in London and one of the most important designers of the Gothic Revival. In Detroit, the earliest and longest lived stained glass studio was begun in 1861 by Charles Friedrichs and Peter Staffen. Friedrichs was German by birth, Staffen's parents were also, and is not known where they learned the craft. But these early windows suggest a strong German influence in design rather than an English one as we saw in the Fort Street and Jefferson Avenue Presbyterian churches. The colors are basically the same eight that were available, but the painting of the figures and architectural details has become more sophisticated than that in the Presbyterian churches, suggesting an art background for one or both of the studio's founders. In 1878, Charles and Peter added the words Detroit Stained Glass to their company name. Staffen left the company in 1896. His partnership was taken over by Edward Wolfram. When Wolfram left in 1914, the company became the Detroit Stained Glass Works. You can just see the end of the name in the center photo. They closed in 1970, having been in business for a remarkable 119 years. By comparison, Tiffany Studios lasted about 48 years. Here are a couple of examples of their more modern work. The sketch is probably from the 1940s or 50s, as is the window. The Gothic style gave way to the Romanesque in the 1870s on the East Coast, led by H. H. Richardson in Boston. His second church, Trinity, on Copley Square, at the heart of the Back Bay, revolutionized church design. Trinity Church was completed in 1877, and although H. H. Richardson died in 1886, his vision of the Romanesque and Byzantine styles as appropriate for churches lived on, taking over the more delicate Gothic revival used in earlier buildings. By the early 1890s, a spate of church building in the area now called Midtown brought Richardsonian Romanesque to Detroit. Between 1889 and 1891, four Romanesque-style churches were built within a few blocks of each other on Woodward and Cass Avenues. Sadly, First Unitarian burned down in 2014. The rest have loving but small congregations who are hard-pressed to heat the buildings, much less maintain their windows and walls. The widening of Woodward Avenue in 1936 sliced the front off the first churches, forcing them to drastically alter their entrances and turn their sanctuaries 90 degrees. Not only do these four churches share the general massing and exterior color and texture of Richardson's Trinity, but their interiors are also richly decorated with polychrome patterns, cast plaster relief, and figural murals. Huge openings pierce the walls to make way for stained glass. At Trinity, Richardson had hired one of the era's preeminent painters, John Lafarge, to decorate the vast interior. Lafarge had recommended that the stained glass windows should be of simple patterning and color in order to show off his murals to their best advantage. Although this did not happen in most of the windows, Lafarge did create a set of such windows in the tower, in a fish scale pattern with a limited but sophisticated palette of complementary colors, green and red, yellow and blue, and purple and orange. 
In First Presbyterian, we have a similar setup. As at Trinity, lower windows in the church are an assortment of memorials made by different studios. But in the Tower Clear Story, there's a unified group of decorative windows with a simple pattern of rectangles and rondelles. What makes them remarkable is their color and materials. Evoking the dawn, they incorporate deep gold rondelles at the bottom, symbolic of the rising sun. Above these, in the center field of the windows, pale yellow blends into salmon pinks, which in turn darken into aqua and green. At the top of each lancet is an amazing hand-spun rondelle, deep turquoise with a dark mysterious center and lighter penumbra, like a lunar eclipse. In palette and selection of rondelles, the tower windows are somewhat similar to a very early Tiffany window. Both of these windows are terrific examples of the use of glass for its sake alone. More remarkable is First Congregational, where almost no memorial windows have encroached on the original decorative glazing. The architect of First Congregational was John Lyman Faxon of Boston, who clearly had Richardson's Trinity in mind when he decorated this church. Even the pews are almost identical to those in Boston. The vast transept windows, a large rose above five small lancets, are made mostly of colorless translucent glass cut in repeating circular quarries, outlined in a border of autumnal leaves in shades of brick, gold, moss, and purple. Far from being cookie-cutter windows, as one source describes them, they are another wonderful example of using great glass just for the sake of it being great stuff. John Faxon, being from Boston, tapped Boston glazier Donald MacDonald to produce these fascinating windows. MacDonald loved interesting glass. The lively streaks and the interesting juxtaposition of purples, reds, and greens interspersed with small vibrant jewels gives this simple border pattern unexpected vivacity. The glass was made in Berkshire County in western Massachusetts at the Berkshire Glass Works, one of the first American glass factories to make colored glass for windows. On the right are examples of blown colored glass made at Berkshire, which they began producing in 1869. Similar glass can be found in other McDonald windows, such as this detail from the Flint Memorial Library in Middleton, Massachusetts, made around the same time. The large hand-spun rondelles in reds, ambers, and deep blues were probably made at the South Boston Antique Glass Works. I apologize for the sort of pixelated appearance here. There was hardware cloth over the window when I photographed it. Tiffany used similar rondelles in many of his windows. In the front of the church is a group of prophets, also by Donald MacDonald. These are quite typical of MacDonald's figural style, with an analogous color scheme, simple drapery, and loose, spontaneous brushwork in a reddish-brown paint on light brown glass. Here is a comparison of one of the prophet's faces to a face in another MacDonald window in Massachusetts, where most of his work can be found. You can see the use of brown glass, which makes his figures all look well tanned. First Unitarian Church was designed in 1890 by Detroit architects Donaldson and Meyer. There's no indication that they saw Richardson's Trinity in person, but like Richardson, they brought the country's most revered stained glass artist, John Lafarge, to create several windows in their church. The first window was prominently placed in the front facade of the building. In 1959, it was given to the Detroit Institute of Arts, where you can see it today. A rather peculiar composition, each section was meant to be viewed as a separate window. From left to right, the first window represents the Angel of Help, the center window, Faith and Hope, and the third, Abu Ben Adam, based on the poem by Lee Hunt, in which an angel appeared to Ben Adam, writing a list of the names of those who love the Lord and their fellow men. 
Interestingly, each window relied on a previous design. In 1890, when the windows were made, Lafarge was busy reclaiming his good reputation and rebuilding his career following his receipt of the Medal of the Legion of Honor at the Paris Exposition in 1889. Commissions were pouring in, and he had to rely on his assistants to help complete designs and projects. Thus, the figures in the Angel of Help window are taken from a previous window of the same name in northeastern Massachusetts. On the left is the window from Detroit, and on the right, northeastern. The different treatment of the figure's gowns marks the difference between Lafarge's early style and his mature one. In the northeastern window, made in 1887, there are many fewer pieces of glass in the drapery. Lafarge relies on changes of color and density within a single piece for the modeling of the fabric. In the Detroit window, created only three years later, he has abandoned the large pieces and now makes each fold of cloth out of several different pieces, each a different color, to obtain a greater effect of realism. Again, on the left, the Detroit window, and on the right, the Northeastern window. The contrast between the types of drapery is even more obvious here. The center two lancets, depicting faith and hope, repeat figures that were used in several other compositions. The angel on the left, for example, can be seen in miniature in the Thomas Crane Memorial window in Quincy, Massachusetts. The woman on the right is practically a stock figure in Lafarge's work. She's similar to the figure on the far right in the red gown, although the pose is flipped and the attitude of the head is slightly different. In the Aboub and Autumn Lancet, Lafarge borrowed the figure of the angel from his 1883 window, the New Jerusalem, in Trinity in Boston. He's down there at the bottom in the Trinity window. Here are the two in close-up. In the New Jerusalem, the figure is St. John the Evangelist, writing the Book of Revelation, so he has no wings. And if it weren't enough to know that Lafarge plagiarized himself, he, like so many other artists of the day, took the Trinity figure from this Correggio painting. Nine years later, Lafarge returned to the First Congregational Church to create this window, called the Good Night. This window was not removed from the church until the 1990s, when it was purchased for a private collection. It's now in the Yale University Art Gallery, along with its color sketch. It is dedicated to Albert Grenville Boynton, a member of the Detroit Light Guard, hence the use of the figure of a knight. Okay, now for a quick quiz. Who can tell me what the major difference is between these two windows, made about 25 years apart? Actually, you probably can't tell very well just from these photos. They represent the before and after of two of the biggest changes in the art of stained glass in its whole thousand year history. The development of opalescent glass and the use of plating or layering of glass in the making of a window. Let's look at the glass first. From the Middle Ages until 1878, stained glass windows, like the Good Shepherd here, were made primarily of what we call antique glass. The word antique has nothing to do with its age. Antique glass is still made today. It means the glass is handmade, blown by mouth. A glob of hot glass was affixed to the end of a blowpipe. The glass blower blew into the glob to make a bubble, then swung it back and forth while continuing to blow. The bubble elongated into an oval tube, which was split down the side and opened flat into a sheet of glass about three feet by four. The glass was colored and transparent. You can see through it, although not clearly. This is the glass that artists in the U.S. bought from Germany. Each pane had only one color. The way the details in the windows were created was by painting them on the glass in brown or black enamel that was then fired into the glass to become permanent. This detail is not of the same window or artist, but it was made around the same time as the Friedrichsen Staff and Good Shepherd window. All the detail you see here 
the hair, facial features, fingers and thumb, even the shading on the face and the negative space in the background diapering. These are all painted. The colors you see, the orange, green, tan, and blue, are in the glass. They're not painted on. This was the way windows had been made since the Middle Ages, when the craft of stained glass was invented. This was all changed around 1880 by these two men, John Lafarge and Louis Comfort Tiffany. Working separately, they were never partners or even friends, they both began to explore the possibilities of using opalescent glass in stained glass windows at the same time in the late 1870s. Their goal was to eliminate the need to paint the glass, because paint dulled the transmission of light and, in their opinion, made the windows muddy looking. They didn't invent opalescent glass. Opaline and opaque glass had been around for several centuries, and in the mid to late 19th century, many glass factories in the U.S. and Europe made vessels out of it, like these you see here. Lafarge and Tiffany's genius was to conceive of using this glass for windows. They went to glass houses in Brooklyn, where glass objects like these were being made, and worked with them to fabricate the glass in flat sheets for use in windows. The flat glass they produced was translucent, not transparent like antique glass. Light came through it, but you couldn't see through it. It often had more than one color in a sheet. Streaks, mottling, and rippled or folded textures were possible, because this was not blown glass. Instead, the molten glass was poured on an iron table and rolled, which gave it a texture. They loved this glass for the effects it could create without having to use paint to model and shade forms. The swirls looked like curling leaves, and the darker areas gave the impression of shadow. Without paint, the windows were brighter, they glowed more. This wasn't all Tiffany and Lafarge did. They also changed the way the windows were put together. Traditionally, the pieces of glass were held together with lead came, which is a strip of lead with an H profile in the upper left. Came has always been available in a variety of sizes, which you can see on the right. Traditionally, the glass was assembled in a single layer, which you see on the bottom. But Tiffany and Lafarge were not satisfied with the many colors they now had in opalescent glass. They wanted more, so they layered pieces of glass on top of each other. This process is called plating. The diagram on the left shows two different ways the glass was held together. In one came on the left, or in two on the right. The top picture on the right shows how Lafarge layered glass. This window had up to five layers, although I've seen as many as eight. On the bottom is part of the same window after it has been put together with lead, and you can see how complicated these windows become. Tiffany's interest in stained glass continued into the making of the glass itself. He eventually opened his own glass factory to produce both sheet glass and blown glass vessels, although he also bought literally tons of sheet glass from other manufacturers. He is known, however, for the unusual types of glass that he created. Drapery glass like this is some of his most famous. To make this, molten glass was poured on an iron table and pushed into folds using an iron rod. Here you can see the mark left by the rod. This is called confetti or fractured glass. To make this, a thin bubble of colored glass was blown, then dunked in cold water to fracture it into small shards. These colored shards were scattered across the iron casting table, and clear glass was poured over the top and rolled into it. There are a number of good Tiffany windows in Detroit. This is a good one to start with following our discussion of the various techniques and glasses found in them. Here, Jesus' pink robe is made of drapery glass. 
If you were to look at this window with no light coming through it, the glass would look white. The pink color is coming from plating behind the white drapery glass. In this little landscape from the left side of the window, we can see how he used confetti glass to make the foliage in the trees. On the ground, streaks in the glass look like grass and water. Here is a detail of the face. Remember how a few minutes ago I talked about the painting in stained glass windows? That Tiffany and Lafarge were attracted to opalescent glass because it didn't need to be painted? Well, for the most part, that remained true. The landscape detail I just showed you included no paint. But in order to depict faces, especially faces that show emotion like this one, they still had to use paint. But it was usually limited to flesh pieces, faces, hands, and feet. A number of the Tiffany windows around Detroit are duplicated images. In this lovely window of St. Elizabeth of Hungary, which has a fantastic selection of glass, the figure of the saint came from other windows used around the country. Here she appears in a section of the Red Cross window in Washington, D.C. The cartoon was flipped left to right, but you can see that the lead lines are largely identical. The Good Shepherd was probably one of Tiffany's most popular window subjects. Variations are all over the country, despite the studio saying in 1908 that it would never make more than one duplicate. They also promised not to put similar windows in the same town. Even windows that look like they should be unique, like this image of the young Jesus, were often not, but the use of different titles can make them harder to locate. The version in Boston, for example, on the right is called the Sparrow. On the ground at the boy's feet is a dead sparrow, which is very hard to see. The figure of St. Agnes was also used a number of times. Here's a pretty lousy internet image of the panel used as an illustration in an 1898 magazine. Perhaps the most unusual Tiffany windows in Detroit are the pair in the Cass Community Church. In design, it could be by any of hundreds of unknown studios around the country who specialized in decorative windows. But we know that this window was made by Tiffany Studios to designs by the church's architects, William Malcolmson and William Higginbotham. The church was one of their first commissions as partners. It was unusual but not unheard of for Tiffany Studios to build windows for architects to their own designs. In 1914, the Prairie School architect George Washington Mayer had Tiffany create the large stained glass windows of his design for his Winona Savings Bank in Minnesota. The best Tiffany windows in Detroit were made for private houses. The most famous is probably this one in the George Beecher House, now owned by Wayne State University. It was one of several featured on the cover of Tiffany Windows by Alistair Duncan, one of the first books to bring Tiffany's work back into the public eye in 1980. The figural portion of the window is the center of six panels that reference music. It has been restored and looks a lot better than this picture suggests. The largest group of Tiffany windows in a private house in Detroit is probably that in the David Whitney house, which many of you may have seen since the house is now a restaurant. Completed between 1890 and 1894, the windows are probably contemporaneous to the house, which means they were finished just as Tiffany Studios was garnering impressive praise for their exhibit at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago, where they were the only stained glass studio represented despite there being hundreds of studios in business at the time. After passing through leaded glass doors, the first window one encounters upon entering is this one at the top of the stairs. Variously called a knight or an explorer, the central figure is a dashing fellow in Renaissance armor and a striking feathered hat, swathed in a blowing red flag. He is set off by side panels of vaguely armorial cartouches, suggestive of heraldry, and intended to wow visitors with the owner's pedigree, real or imagined. 
The music room windows form a set of four that alternate musical figures with cherubs. The window on the far right was badly damaged and repaired, but the others are intact. The figures are an unusual combination of Christian and pagan, St. Cecilia on the left end and Orpheus on the right. It's not common to find saints in domestic music rooms, although the choice is understandable, as she is the patron saint of music. Orpheus was the Greek musician who was allowed to bring his wife Eurydice back from the dead, providing he didn't look back to see if she was following him. The cherubs continue the decorative painting of the music room, as though those in the ceiling have descended the walls to continue their serenade. It's possible that the painter of the ceiling designed these windows. The best window in the house is the one least often seen. Hidden away as a transom in a bedroom, this glorious peonies window shows Tiffany Studios at their greatest. The realism of the tumble of flowers suggests the window was designed by Agnes Northrup, the studio's principal landscape and floral designer. The contrast of primary colors, red, blue, and yellow, brings a whole rainbow to the composition. To me, one of the most fascinating uses of stained glass in 19th century America is as decoration on ships, steamers, packets, yachts, you name it. Detroit is fortunate to have a survival of this trend in the Dawson Great Lakes Museum. It is in the Gothic Room from the SS City of Detroit III, an enormous passenger steamer built by the Detroit and Cleveland Navigation Company in 1912 to sail the Great Lakes between Buffalo and Detroit. At over 500 feet long, the ship boasted 600 staterooms. The Gothic Room was a smoking salon, a typically male domain, and it was decorated with this window, depicting the landing in Detroit of the explorer La Salle, a good masculine subject. The explorer in his bright red coat shows the land to his confreres, ignoring the Indians who already lived there. A period description of the ship in the magazine Ohio Architect and Builder erroneously attributed the windows to Tiffany. They were in fact made in Birmingham, England by the prolific firm of John Hardman and Company, a studio that had been started with the encouragement of the Gothic Revival architect A. W. N. Pugin. One can't help but wonder what Pugin would have thought about depicting Native Americans in stained glass in a Gothic room. The Ohio Magazine may have been confusing Tiffany's earlier work in glass depicting American Indians, like this window of Minnehaha from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem Hiawatha, designed for the Columbian Exposition, and now in Duluth. Or the great mosaic in Chicago, depicting the life of La Salle's fellow explorer Jacques Marquette. Not all interesting stained glass is by known makers or designers. On the left is a window from the Herman Rome house, now one of the houses that makes up the inn on Ferry Street. Although the house is a more or less typical Queen Anne style, the window nods toward American Art Nouveau. The sinuous strap work at the tops of the lower sashes is almost Celtic, similar to the fanciful designs of the Chicago firm Healy and Millet, who so impressed the judges at the 1889 Paris Exposition that the French government bought their whole exhibit for what is now the Musée d'Orsay, and who created decorative windows for Louis Sullivan's auditorium building in 1894. The arts and crafts movement is well represented in Detroit's stained glass in the work of Charles Connick, especially his windows for the Cathedral of St. Paul. The cathedral was designed by Ralph Adams Cram of Cram and Goodhue. Cram was an authority on stained glass and is largely responsible for the move away from opalescent glass back to painted antique glass. If you look carefully at the detail on the right, you can see that every piece of glass has paint lines on it. Cram loathed Tiffany's work. Connick became one of Cram's hand-picked studios. 
Cram liked Connick so much that he paid for the young man to travel to Europe to see the medieval windows, and when he returned, Cram lent him the money to start his own studio. Connick was deeply influenced by another of Cram's favorite stained glass artists, the Englishman Christopher Wall. Wall worked in the arts and crafts style and published an influential technical manual in 1905 called Stained Glass Work. His windows were especially noted for their use of a silvery white glass, heavy lead lines, and brilliant bits of color. Connick was first exposed to Wall's work in Boston, where Connick lived. Cram had commissioned five windows from Wall for his parish church, Church of the Advent, on Beacon Hill. The window installers, who were Bostonian, laughed with derision when they pulled the windows out of the shipping crates, saying they were sloppily painted and muddy-looking. Connick agreed and watched them install the glass high into the clear story of the dark church. He later wrote, I recalled that impression with a start when I saw those sections of glass glowing serenely and beautifully. I understood how tiny spots of light through those areas of dirty paint had, in distance, illumined entire windows in a gracious fashion. I awoke to the charm of glassiness, and soon I gloried in the discovery of Christopher Wall. Aside from his design sensibilities and style, the thing that made Wall's windows different was the glass. Remember how I showed you how antique glass was made? blown into a long narrow bubble and split to make a large sheet. Wall favored a glass generically called Norman slab. This glass was blown into a square mold about the size of a Clorox bottle. The bottle was cut at the corners to make small sheets about six inches by nine. As you can see at the bottom, the slabs were very thick in the center and thinner on the sides. They were also of the most brilliant colors, or of a silvery gray white with faintly tinted streaks of color. This is what Wall used in his windows. Connick had his own style, but it was clearly influenced by Wall. Although his palette was not always as white as Wall's, he did adopt the intense colors of fuchsia, ruby, rich turquoise, cobalt, and deep amethyst. Until 1925, Charles Connick worked in this style. Many of his windows show the influence of the Pre-Raphaelites, such as Edward Burne Jones. He was fond of the Arthurian legends and used knights and medieval figures wherever he could. This all changed in 1925 when he visited the Paris Exposition and discovered Art Deco. Another interesting artist who was favored and heavily influenced by Ralph Adams Cram was Harry Eldridge Goodhue, the younger brother of Cram's partner Bertram Grosvenor Goodhue. Harry's first window on the left was for Cram and Goodhue's first church, All Saints Ashmont in Boston, and was installed where it would eventually face this Christopher Wall window on the right. In his early days as a stained glass artist, Goodhue followed the opalescent style of Tiffany and Lafarge, as we see here. But his strength as an artist developed when he gave up opalescent glass in favor of antique, following Cram's and Wall's lead. He became an ardent convert. He created his first antique glass window in 1902 for a church in Newport, Rhode Island, and never looked back. He opened his own studio in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1903 and started writing articles aimed at convincing the buying public to use antique glass windows. Why should we be afraid of pure color, he wrote. The men of the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries were not. His window for St. John's in Detroit was one of his last. It was actually completed by his wife after his untimely death at the age of 45. It's one of his finest windows. In his later years, his studio produced windows like that on the left, which were more like the work of 19th century English firms like Heaton Butler and Bain or Clayton and Bell, using a lot of heavily painted white glass, dull colors, and perpendicular canopy work. The St. John's window, however, is an example of his most mature and independent arts and crafts style, with a vibrant palette 
and interesting details. The palette of tertiary colors here recalls the work of William Morris and Edward Byrne Jones. When Harry Goodhue died in 1918, he left a wife and three young sons. The oldest of those sons, Harry Wright Goodhue, followed in his father's artistic footsteps, surpassing him as an artist when just a child. Wright, as he was called, was a prodigy, earning a profile in the Boston Herald when he was just 11 years old. He was 13 when his father died. At 16, he left school to become an artist, much to his uncle Bertram's disappointment. Bertram Goodhue recognized the boy's talent, but despaired about his ability to get along in the world, thinking him a little bit odd. Wright designed his first window in 1921, when he was 17, for a church designed by his uncle. In 1927, he designed two windows for St. Dunstan's Chapel in Christ Church at Cranbrook Academy, the renowned art school in Bloomfield Hills outside of Detroit. St. Dunstan is the patron saint of craftsmen, an appropriate selection for Cranbrook. Bertram Goodhue had originally been chosen to design Christ Church Cranbrook, but passed away before starting. Wright commemorated his uncle in a detail in the St. Dunstan window on the right, holding a model of the church. On the left in the same window is a quirky portrait of Bertram's favorite sculptor, Johannes Kirschmeier. Despite Wright's obvious passion for and understanding of medieval art, Cram and others commented on a certain, quote, weird distortion, unquote, and an element of caricature akin to the work of the English graphic artist Aubrey Beardsley. Others found Wright's colors to be powerful and mesmerizing. One client praised the, quote, deep blood reds, tawny yellows, and deep and mysterious blues, unquote. Cram wrote that Wright, quote, supremely understood space composition, color combination, and the unique quality of the clear silhouette, while he had a passion for azure and handled it in the most masterly fashion, unquote. Despite Wright's great talent and promise, he took his own life in 1931, a month after he turned 26. In his ten-year career, he had completed a lifetime's worth of mature work. The eulogies were glowing, calling him a genius and one of the foremost designers of stained glass in America, perhaps unrivaled, certainly unsurpassed, in his command of rhythmic line and glowing color. One writer called him the reincarnation in modern times of some spirit out of the Middle Ages. Cram described him as a great, unhappy, and unique genius. On a happier note, Detroit has a couple of other excellent examples of Art Deco stained glass. This is the Mariner's Church, whose original diamond-paned windows we saw earlier. In 1955, the church was moved about 900 feet and heavily refurbished. New stained glass was designed by Catherine Lamb Tate of the J&R Lamb Stained Glass Studios, the oldest stained glass studio in the U.S. It's still in business today, although none of the Lamb family are involved with it anymore. Although 1955 is long after the end of the Art Deco period, these windows exhibit the modern forms, a spiky geometry reminiscent of the Chrysler Building in New York. But of course, the queen of Art Deco interiors in Detroit, and one of the finest in the country, is the Guardian Building. Originally the Union Trust Building, the interior decoration was the vision of Wirt Rowland in 1929, using colored marbles with rookwood and poabic tiles in a style that draws deeply on Native American designs. The two identical stained glass windows in the east wall of the elevator lobbies actually depict stylized American Indians. One represents fidelity on the right and the other security, representing the ideals of the original banking owner of the building. The windows were designed by George Green from Pittsburgh, who also built windows designed by another artist for Henry Ford's house, Fairlane. He had originally been part of the stained glass company Leak and Green, who designed windows for Henry Clay Frick's home in Pittsburgh. And so we have come full circle in our stories of windows richly dight. The stained glass heritage of Detroit is rich and varied, 
a microcosm of the craft in America. Thank you.